we uh, from Norway in Norway we will arrange our Trondheim conference uh, this summer in July also to to make sure that we strengthen the the scientific uh, um, the knowledge and also the the need we have to really discuss what kind of agreement are we looking for in 2020 because I think with the, we, we are talking a lot about how we need to raise ambition, how we need to act and we need to act now and, and we really agree on that but it's also we need to get a better agreement that we had when we now look towards uh, 2030 to make sure that, uh, that the goals we set for ourselves are also the goals that we achieve. I think also in the whole framework of thinking, it is, to me, it was a, when we looked at last fall, when we got a 1.5 degree report, it really said two things. One, it said that uh, we are in a very difficult situation, the situation is grave, but the other, it also said that you can reach and stay below 1.5 degrees, and the only way to reach that goal is to move forward. It's, it's with invention, it's an economic development, that you really have to have a development to be able to reach the targets. And I also think uh, to preserve nature, it's all about connecting these goals also with the sustainable development goals, Thank that it's impossible to reach those SDG targets without preserving nation, without combating marine litter, and without combating and stopping global warming. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Her Excellency, Ms. Ornola, so see Deputy Minister, Minister, Ministry of Tourism and Environment, you have two minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, dear Excellencies, uh, dear colleagues. So I am, uh, I am representing a small country, Albania, in Balkans. Can you raise your, just raise your voice a little bit and okay. come closer to the mic. Thank it's you. okay? Yeah, Okay, that's thank fine. you. So I am representing Albania, a small country in Balkans, uh, in development. We are small countries, but we have big problems and uh, very small environmental budgets, unfortunately. So I will give you two, two examples, as uh, Madam uh, Chair asked. Uh, we have a very big transition in this country, 28 years transition. And in, this 20, uh, in, the, in, in the last 10 years, by uh, 2006 and 2000, uh, to 2000, uh, 70, uh, 16, we have lost 32% of our volume, forestry, uh, volume of the forestry in our country. For the first time in 27 or 28 years, we are in the su surplus with our forestry because we had the volunteer to have drastic measures. And we had two dr drastic measures, two moratoriums, the moratorium of tree cutting and the moratorium of hunting in my country. And for, for the first time, we had a very big campaign for planting trees clean and green Albania 2020. And for the first time, we have increased the volume of our, tree, of our forestry in my country. But also, I will show you that it's not only the volunteer that we need. For example, in 2010, we have, uh, in the frame of the Agreement of Stabilization and Association for the EU, we had uh, decided to, to have the, the first strategy of uh, the management, integrated management of urban waste. We have worked a lot about this. We have spent a lot of funds about the strategy. And uh, for two years, we have devised a copy-paste strategy uh, a German strategy, because we have no the knowledge for this strategy, a German strategy for the Albania reality. And also, uh, we have spent the majority of our funds for creating this strategy. And 10 years, uh, five or four years now, we, have, we are a very dirty country, really. Our biggest problem, they are the waste, uh, they are everywhere, the management of the urban waste. And our big gap, it is the implementation, implementation of the laws and the implementation of strategies and the implementation of our action plans. So we are working only to make plans and strategies and we are not implementing, implementing Thank them. You. Half a minute, I'm sorry uh, for one, uh, What is our, uh, our let's say, uh, we, we need the regional collaboration. We can't do uh, uh, this alone because we are small countries. We would need Balkan collaboration. If we, uh, as a country, decide to, uh, we are working for uh, banning all plastic use 
all uh, single plastic use. If our neighbors' countries don't, we are destined to, to fail. And if Albania wish to implement uh, the ban of all plastic bags, uh, if, our if our neighbor countries don't, we are designated fails. And also if Albania wish to implement the deposit system for recycling ma recyclable materials and our neighbors can, don't, we are designated to fails. So that we need is to support and to, uh, to support our collaboration and to support with funds our country because we are small countries and we have no the opportunity to invest more for the environment. Okay, thank you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, really. I appreciate that. Her Excellency, Her Excellency Ms. Elizabeth Taylor J., Permanent Representative to the United Nations Environment Program and Ambassador to Kenya, Republic of Colombia. You have the floor for two minutes. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. And I'm very proud to see uh, all these ladies uh, uh, leaders in, in science and also in environmental management. So Colombia has mentioned repeatedly that the definition of the main challenges and priorities for the post-2020 framework and decision making on this subject should be based on knowledge and scientific evidence. Only this way we can really have a discussion based on objective criteria with respect to the identification and also as how the um, Sweden ministers say uh, on the reason why some Archie targets and the Minister of Norway too uh, have not been reached. The lesson learned and the good practices which may, may be useful for the post 2020 framework as well as the level of ambition uh, that we uh, should have and we think that ambition should be uh, quite high uh, in, in, in the sense uh, uh, that uh, the rate of uh, environmental degradation, it's, it's rapid and our actions are, are slow, so we really need to move uh, toward that. Uh, respect to the structure, uh, we think that uh, we should have a long-term framework up to 2050. We also propose to establish rolling plans of actions with a validity of 10 years uh, that are sufficiently flexible to facilitate their updating if necessary. Uh, at the same time, also, uh, we think that the progress in updating, if it's necessary, we could use a five years framework. And this will allow parties to focus their attention every five years on the analysis of the bottlenecks uh, to achieve the targets. No, Colombia suggests the adoption of, of these uh, global goals, uh, one of each obje objective of the convention to act as umbrella commitments as, as the long term which will guide the actions linked to specific target under this umbrella. And in our opinion, uh, uh, the the possible goals and target of the post-2020 global framework must be supported by enabling conditions that facilitate the implementation, such as mainstreaming, as was mentioned before, prioritizing the local level, because we have been working on policies, we have been discussing at the global level, but we don't have the scale down that is really needed to the local level, to the productive sectors, and all uh, sectors involved in uh, making sure that we can have a healthy environment. Strengthening of science, technology, and innovation, uh, means of implementation, which is uh, very important, and voluntary commitments, which uh, we should not uh, be seen as commitment that has made uh, thinking about trading off or thinking about that we are going to get some compensation for that. So okay. just to finish, uh, so the way, the way to plan, we need to um, innovate in our way of planning. We need to involve all sectors. Uh, as how I said, we need to raise ambitions, the goal and policies, but at the same time, we need to boost our uh, capacity to act and, and implement. We must stop leave our actions for the last moment. I think that's a, a very important message that I want to leave uh, with you. We must work systematically every day on the results, and we also have to have a bottom-up game changing and science informing decisions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so very much. That was so quick. I appreciate that. Thank you. Mr. Daniel Kaleja, Director General of the Directorate General for the Environment, European Union. Daniel, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I'm giving you only two minutes. Thank you very much, <laughs> Minister. Thank you very much, Jasmine. I will use one. And I will be very straightforward. I think we need to do five things. First of all, biodiversity has to become 
the top priority. Uh, we need to have a solid process for meaningful, for meaningful commitments linked to quantifiable global targets and a review mechanism for implementation. Second, we need to accelerate scientific work because we need to understand better the biological and economical implications of living beyond planetary boundaries. And I was very pleased to learn the work of IUCN because we need the two degrees centigrade equivalent to measure biodiversity. Third, mobilize private resources and also the public sector. We need to be very clear, investing in nature is the best investment that we can have because the cost of inaction is exponential, not just for nature, but for the society and for the economy at large. If ecosystems collapse, food and water shortages will generate a multiplier of crisis beyond economic quantification. And the public funds have to stop financing unsustainable activities and blend more with the private sector, with platforms and with nat natural capital solutions. Fourth, make clear and have better coherence between climate change and biodiversity. The interdependence is clear and we have not done enough. And last but not least, mobilize and work with public opinion. In the European cities, we have every Thursday school children marching in the streets fighting for our planet. Their message must be paralleled with ambition for action that can safeguard the generations to come. And we can, with them, make the UN Biodiversity Conference in Kunming a game changer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. That was really very quick and straight and to the point. <laughs> I challenge others to be just like Daniel, to be so quick and to the point. I now give the floor to Ms. Ivona Higur, Secretary General of CITES. Thank you very much, Madam. I know you will be speaking on behalf of the liaison group of the biodiversity related convention. Ex exactly. Thank you, Madam. So Excellency. I would like to give you three minutes, not two minutes, because you're speaking on behalf of other <laughs> biodiversity conventions. In fact, I will Our speak. Sister conventions. <laughs> Thank you very much, Excellency. And I, I will actually speak in one minute, I'm hoping, maybe Thank one you. minute and a half. Thank you. Thank yes, you. indeed. I speak on behalf of the biodiversity liaison group, which represents eight of the biodiversity related conventions. Thank you so much for allowing us the opportunity to speak at during this round table. We are, as you know, we meet regularly to explore opportunities for synergistic activities between the conventions and increase coordination and to exchange information. We are intervening at this time to express our gratitude to the parties of the Convention on Biological Diversity for establishing an inclusive process for the preparation of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. We also wish to express our gratitude to the government of Switzerland for offering to host the first workshop among biodiversity-related conventions on the post-2020 global biodiversity framework, which will take place in Montreux, Switzerland, in June of this year. And this way we can ensure that all biodiversity needs are considered. Many of our member convention secretariats have been given a mandate to contribute to this process, and others, like the one I service, have submitted resolutions on this issue to our governing bodies. We look forward to integrating the outcome into the visions and strategies for all biodiversity-related conventions, and in this way, we hope to encourage cooperation and synergies also at the national level between the biodiversity-related conventions. The Biodiversity Liaison Group is committed and eager to engage collectively in the process of the development of the framework. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Ivana. Uh, Mr. Marco Lambertini, Director General of the WWF International. You have two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Lambertini. And thank, thank you, you for, the, for the wonderful video. <laughs> thank you very much, Minister. Um, so I, I'm not going to mention integration because it's been mentioned so much. Um, and of course, we support, we support the principle. But let me uh, highlight uh, a few other components that we think should be really featured strongly in the post 2020 framework of the Convention on Biological Diversity that we feel um, should be um, turned into a shorthand nature convention. I think they will be resonating much more with the public uh, and will be more communicable as well. The first uh, is a new narrative. It was mentioned before, a narrative that positions nature 
at the center of sustainable development as indispensable for our health uh, and our prosperity uh, and in the future. And I think this is not a little shift. Biodiversity is not just the elephants, the tigers, the jaguars that we love, particularly in the WWF, is the fish we eat, is the insect that pollinates our crops and the worms that keeps our soil fertile. Second point about the targets. Um, I completely agree with Daniel. Uh, the targets should be uh, ambitious, should be quantifiable. You cannot manage, you cannot me uh, measure, right. and, and the IG target shows very clearly. The target that we are about to achieve is the one on protected areas that is quantifiable. And the two degrees give that great opportunity to every country, every sector, uh, to uh, uh, plan their contribution in an accountable way. So quantifiable for sure. Maybe it's one target, maybe it's more than one. We think it should be too many. They should be memorable and communicable, but particularly they should talk about the contribution of nature to society. Imagine if you are beginning to talk about protected areas in a different way, in a way where it is using a number of different lenses, the lens of biodiversity, but also the lens of food security, the lens of water security, the lens of health, the lens of traditional lifestyles, the lens of infrastructure that are green and not uh, damaging the environment. This will create a completely different discourse and will create a much, much stronger business case for engagement of the private sector, for example. And finally, I agree with other comments before, a strong, much stronger uh, mechanism for implementation. Thank you. Because uh, the principles are good, but implementation and action, as I said, is super important. Let me say one last thing. I want to stress the fact that the 200 million people that will look at the documentary that we all seen this morning, plus many others that will try to mobilize, we look at Kumin in China in 2020, expecting a big result for nature, as we achieved for, for climate yes. in Paris. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. My, my third question, very quickly, and we have a couple of speakers, is how can we overcome the barriers of linking the three conventions together, the three global environmental challenges, the biodiversity loss, climate change, and land degradation in a more integrated way that would enhance benefit, effectiveness, and efficiency. I would like to give the floor to Her Excellency, Ms. Josefa Lionel Sacco, the Commissioner for Rural Economy and Agriculture of the African Union Commission. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you. Th thank you, the Chair. Thank you, the Minister. Uh, I will first of all like to, how many minutes? You didn't tell me, so I will, take I will not take advantage of it, but you did not tell me how many minutes. Sorry. But I'll be very short. I'm asking how many minutes do I have? Two to three minutes. No, but I will not take much time. Okay. So, okay, so Thank you. it is a pleasure for us at the African Union to be here and to share our experience on how we are doing, dealing with all climate actions. So it was really a great pleasure for us to be working with the government of Egypt, the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological uh, Diversity, the Secretariat of uh, African Ministerial Conference on Environment, and the UN Environment in organizing the African Ministerial Summit on uh, Biodiversity, which was held on the 13th November 2018 in uh, Sharm El Sheikh in Egypt. Uh, the summit adopted a ministerial declaration on biodiversity, including a comprehensive Pan-African action agenda on ecosystem restoration for increasing resilience and the list of African biodiversity priority. The Pan-African action agenda will be submitted for endorsement by uh, the next African Union uh, assembly of head of state and government that will take place next January 2020. I am pleased to report that good progress has been made in, to implement the outcome of the summit. In collaboration with NEPAD, we are working with NEPAD, our African Union, the government of Egypt, the C CBD, Secretariat, and the UN Environment. Uh, we are organizing a cons uh, consultation, a follow-up workshop, where we also organize a workshop here in this uh, city of Nairobi from the 9 and 10 of March. And uh, we will uh, also uh, organize another member states uh, framework on bio biodiversity that will be held on the 2nd and the 5th of uh, April 
2000 and this year in uh, Nairobi. The implementation of the Pan-African agenda is being harmonized and integrated into five regional flagship programs approved by the African Ministerial Conference on the Environment, AMSEN, and the African Union in uh, 2013 to ensure complementary and uh, avoid duplication in implementing and reporting. The African Union Commission will also be hosting the regional consultation on the post-2020 global biodiversity framework for Africa in collaboration with the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity and NEPAD and the headquarters, at the headquarters in Addis Ababa from the 2nd to the 5th of April. Those are the actions that we are taking this year in 2020, uh, 2019, and it's also a capture in our own plan of action for this year. So I thank you for your kind attention. Shukran. Thank Merci you. beaucoup. Asante sana. Muito obrigada. Thank you, Your Excellency. Thank you. And we do look forward for the regional consultation that will take place by the African Union for the post-2020 for Africa. Now I give the floor to Honorable Mr. Mous uh, Velkati, the Minister of Tourism and Environmental Affairs of Eswatini. Uh, thank Your Excellency. Thank you very much. The question is clear forward and um, one of the challenges we are seeing is that uh, as much as we have these three conventions, but they are unintent intentionally create, creating a fragmentation and silos, which is really creating a problem in how uh, we move forward, such that there is duplication uh, even at national level. So what, what do we recommend? One, at global level, we are saying let's provide a high level joint framework for enhancing coordination and coherence among the three RIO conventions. The joint liaison group have done some work on this, but there is need to move to the next level, which is the implementation level, and leverage on existing decisions um, under the three conventions, which calls for enhanced cooperation and collaboration. A good example of such is the PRS coordination for chemicals and waste where the Basel Convention, the Rotterdam Convention, as well as the Stockholm uh, Convention have joined hands to tackle chemical and waste problems. So we think that that is one of them. But also provision of incentives for, for cross-cutting initiatives would actually help where programs and projects are incentivized. And at national level, what do we recommend? We are recommending an establishment of a one-stop coordination mechanism for the implementation and domestic domestication of multilateral environment agreements. For example, in the Kingdom of Eswatini, we have done that. We have established a, na a national coordination unit for MEAs under the Ministry of Tourism and Environmental Affairs, which is now responsible for coordinating all environmental issues and EMAs using the sector-wide approach. Obviously, at the start, there was a lot of resistance, but we have already seen the impact. One, we have identified duplications, we have seen synergies and gaps in the domestications of the MEAs. It is doable, but it calls for a lot of planning. This has also greatly assisted us uh, in, in, in improved reporting under the RIO, uh, RIO Convention as common data collection sheets have been developed to consolidate data required to fulfill our report, reporting uh, requirements. And we think that is the way to go. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was really very useful. Uh, I now would like to give the floor to His Excellency Mr. Gumunder Inji, Minister of, for the Environment and Natural Resources of Iceland. Yes, thank you, Madam Minister. And I agree with many that have spoken here. It's great to see four women up there. I, I have many women as my role models, so I'm, I'm very happy to see this. Well, my first point goes to that we really need to get out of the silos because we live within a system, but not in separate boxes. And I think that the post-2020 framework really needs to specifically look at targets for synergetic approaches. 
tackling climate change, biodiversity, and land degradation simultaneously, these three important conventions all at the same time. And this will benefit both adaptation and mitigation when it comes to climate change. So talking about indices, thermometers, if you will, we need to make those capture all of these issues that I mentioned, because silos are only the inventions of humans and we can change those. Now in Iceland we have implemented policies and programs on such synergies, including using uh, incentives for farmers. And we've also shown interest here in this meeting in exploring opportunities to work with developing countries on these issues. Now secondly, I want to mention the importance of protected areas and in particular national parks when it comes to synergetic approaches as well. Um, both when it comes to those three main conventions that we have been talking about, but also by intertwining nature and economy. We did a study last year in Iceland on 12 uh, protected areas, which found out that for every, for every crown, Icelandic crown, our currency, we put into uh, these areas, we got 23 out of the system again, uh, enhancing both the local and, and the uh, national economy a lot. Um, so with that, I also want to make one pledge that we are aiming for increasing our total uh, protected area, terrestrial area, up to 35 to 40% before 2020 with the establishment of a national park in the central highland of Iceland. So thank you very much, Madam it's Minister. It's 35 to 40%? 35 to 40% of the total country area, yes. Wow. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, now I would like to give the floor to His Excellency Mr. Slavomir Mazurk, Deputy Minister of the Environment of the Republic of Poland. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your leadership in, uh, uh, in Sharm el Sheikh, but also today, and uh, the strong voice from uh, Nairobi for all the community on the world. I think uh, in this uh, topic we need uh, looking for the solution solution who is the synergy, synergy between convention. When we're thinking uh, how to uh, acting in that, uh, our, I, I see the, I see the, uh, the forestry. Uh, the, the forestry is the, is the solution when we can acting. In Poland we're planting 500 million trees every year. We have very good institution in the state forest. The state forests play a very important role because they play, it's not plant, only plantation, this is the uh, looking like the natural forest because it's the, uh, planting in the sustainable way. Uh, and this is uh, something what we're proud of, but also is, uh, we see this solution for the many places because we know what problem we have, hunger, we have the problem with water, we have problem with many, uh, many in different places, very uh, high agenda, uh, the desertification also. And the forestry is the, the, the answer for, for that. And I think uh, it is very important for the future of the mankind to using this, uh, this uh, what, what we have from the forestry. And uh, I think the very important, the rule of forest ecosystem is the preventing by the climate change and how to fully exploiting their potential of CO2 things. This example, uh, it is an example of mainstreaming of biodiversity to the different sectoral policy. Uh, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm the, the using the ecosystem, using the nature, but in the sustainable way, I think is the, the crucial. Uh, I think the, I, I back for one moment to the Katowice, uh, when we adopt not only Katowice rule book, but also the, the free declaration, the forest climate declaration was invited the Polish presidency at COP24. Uh, it was part of, I'm, pr I'm proud for, for this declaration. And I think we'll be using this declaration also to support the process to uh, what Minister from the Costa Rica said about the, uh, the, how to increasing the, 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 the forestry in, uh, in all of the world and give the solution for the people, for many areas, for better life uh, on the earth. Thank you very Thank much you. for your, for your Thank attention. Thank you very much for that. Now I give the floor to His Excellency Mr. Noah Gal Jindler, Permanent Representative and Ambassador of Israel to Kenya. You have the floor. Minister Yasmin, Excellencies, Israel is home to rich biodiversity, unique landscape and natural heritage, 
and it is a pathway for 500 million migratory birds annually. However, due to fast population growth of about 2% per year, Israel land resources are severely limited and under constant pressure due to the development of housing and infrastructure. Israel's most threatened environmental resources are open spaces and water, and measures to protect them are needed. Such measure, measures are in accordance with IG targets and SDG 14 and 15. One of the most robust regulatory and enforcement tools for nature conservation in Israel is Nature Reserves and National Parks Declaration. Currently, approximately 25% of Israel land is protected, surpassing IG target 11 for ter terrestrial e ecosystems. 31 new nature reserves and national parks were declared in the years 2017 and 18, thus adding over 3% to Israel protected areas. Furthermore, the largest marine reserve in Israel was approved in, in 2018, adding 2.5% two, two of Israel territorial sea to the protected network. Looking forward, one of the main challenges for Israel in relation to the protecting ecosystem is to maintain ecological corridors and to add more yeah. underrepresented ecosystem to our protected area system, aiming at protecting 30% of terrestrial and at least 10% of marine environment. As for IG Target 8, major progress has been made in reducing pressures on aquatic ecosystems and in pollution reduction as part of river restoration. Over the last two decades, discharges into the Mediterranean Sea, mostly from industrial sources, have been reduced by 95 to 100 percent, and loads of contaminants discharged into the rivers were reduced by 60 to 90 percent. This major environmental... 30 seconds, I'm sorry for that, but we need to finish because I have other, other colleagues. Please do. Okay, go ahead. I'm over. You're over? Okay. Um, His Excellency, Mr. <laughs> Nathan Nataboli, a permanent representative of the United Nations Environment Program and ambassador uh, of Kenya, ambassador to Kenya, Uganda. You have the floor, Your Excellency. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Your Excellency, and thank you for inviting Uganda. I'll go straight to the, to the responses. One. We need to create synergies in implementing the Rio Convention and other bio biodiversity-related conventions at all levels, the global, regional, and the national. Two, promote multifocal programs, projects of the biodiversity, sustainable land management, and climate change. Three, Prioritize restoration of land and, <coughs> and land degraded ecosystems. What has Uganda done in these areas? I'll give only two examples. One, for a ministry, department, or agency to access public funding, that ministry must indicate in its uh, action plan activities it will undertake in addressing the environmental challenges, including the one we are discussing. Two, with the assistance of, uh, technical assistance of uh, UNEP, we were able to come up with the Wetlands Atlas. This Wetlands Atlas is now being used to protect the wetlands, to restore those which have been uh, eroded, and as well as to prevent any further destruction. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being so short and, and concise. I would like to give the floor finally one minute to the representative of China to give uh, some insights on the adoption of the Ambition Post 2020. If the representative of China is here, no, he's not available. I will not be giving a closing remark because we've kept the room so many uh, of, a, of a time from our colleagues. I just would like to thank every and single uh, contribution that was made here. 
uh, from all the representatives. I would like to give my thanks also to Ms. Anderson and to Ms. Amina Mohammed and to my sister Christiana Pashka Palmer. We will be communicating shortly with you. We will collect all the comments and the responses and the pledges and the commitments and we will continue together this journey until we reach China safely for a very ambitious and a bold post-2020 framework for biodiversity. Thank you so very much. The evening mood in Muscat is busy, but we can't stay long. On this night, we have fitted a small light in the falcon's nesting cavity which will allow us to see what the falcons do at night. They don't do much when not preening the young falcon sleep. For a short time, clouds accumulate in the humid air, but as quickly as they appeared, they disappear. Later, the stars move silently above our camp. It's morning and time for breakfast. Nervously, the young falcons await their mother's arrival. As soon as the female has left, the scientists are back. This time the oldest chick is selected and the researchers fit it with a special solar power transmitter in such a way as to not hinder flight. Important data on date, time, movement, location, elevation, activity, temperature and other variables will be transmitted back to the researchers via satellite. After the research team has left, the nestlings are hungry. The little Hello. bite is really just a starter. Nearby is a large colony of greater crested terns in which many chicks have hatched. Just prior to fledging, greater crested tern chicks form a crash. And this is good defense against predators. However, some late chicks are not in the crash. The falcon has a try. Finally, the food service has arrived. The evening mood in Muscat is busy, but we can't stay long. On this night, we have fitted a small light in the falcon's nesting cavity, which will allow us to see what the falcons do at night. They don't do much yeah. when not yeah. preening you. the young falcon sleep. For a short time, clouds accumulate in the humid air, but as quickly as they appeared, they disappear. Later, the stars move silently above our camp.
It's morning and time for breakfast. Nervously, the young falcons await their mother's arrival. As soon as the female has left, the scientists are back. This time the oldest chick is selected and the researchers fit it with a special solar power transmitter in such a way as to not hinder flight. Important data on date, time, movement, location, elevation, activity, temperature and other variables will be transmitted back to the researchers via satellite. After the research team has left, the nestlings are hungry. The little bite is really just a starter. Nearby is a large colony of greater crested terns in which many chicks have hatched. Just prior to fledging, greater crested tern chicks form a crash. And this is good defense against predators. However, some late chicks are not in the crash. The falcon has a try. Finally, the food service has arrived. Testing, one, two, three. Testing, one, two, three. The evening mood in Muscat is busy, but we can't stay long. On this night, we have fitted a small light in the falcon's nesting cavity, which will allow us to see what the falcons do at night. They don't do much when not preening the young falcon's sleep. For a short time, clouds accumulate in the humid air, but as quickly as they appeared, they disappear. Later, the stars move silently above our camp. Good afternoon, everyone. Can people settle down, please? Find your seats. Don't move around in the room so that we can get started. We are very time distressed, and I would really request everyone to take their seats so that we can get started as quickly as possible. Yes. All our panelists are here except Christine. And I hope she can hear me and she can meander up to the stage here. Are the panelists ready here? Okay, I think we need to get started because of this time distress we face. And welcome, all of you, welcome this afternoon to this panel. It's a great panel. We have experts from biodiversity. We have experts on food and agriculture, on oceans. We have a representative from the faith-based organization. We have Mami sitting next to me, who's an expert on disasters and disaster management. <clears throat> and we have a representative from the Global Environmental Facility. Now, what we've been hearing throughout UNIA 4 is the math is just not adding up. The math is terrible on climate change. 
It's terrible on biodiversity. It's terrible on energy use. It's terrible on fresh water. It's terrible on disasters. So if you look at all the outlooks, the regional outlooks, the resources outlook, the chemical outlook, Geo6 itself, things are just not adding up. And there's nothing iterative or small or something in the margins that can be done to change this. In fact, these six words from Geo6 stick in my mind. Urgent action at an unprecedented scale is what's required. So what I'm requesting all the panelists to do is first take off your domain hats. Uh, it's not biodiversity alone we want to talk about. It's not food and agriculture alone that we want to talk about. It's not disasters alone. It's not oceans alone. We've been told to look at things in a joined up way. That's the message of the SDGs. Look at things as an integrated system whole. And the GEO6 is telling us, take urgent action at an unprecedented scale. So I'm going to shift the minds of those who are taking part in this conversation away from their domain areas. But the things we are going to look at, food security, food systems, and related issues like biodiversity, etc., they are a test case. They're a wonderful model, a prototype, in fact, for the kinds of things we've been recommending in the Sustainable Development Goals. 70% of people in poverty depend on natural resources. Land distribution and ownership particularly in the poor world, determines inequality. Demographic projections look very, very serious. The ecological footprint of food systems is very large, and it's one of the root causes of conflict. So the economic dimension, the social dimension, the environmental dimension, and the dimension of peace and justice are all there in this discussion around the food systems of the future, and everything related to the food systems of the future. Now, what I'd like to tease out in this dialogue and this discussion is big picture thinking. How do we really get there uh, to the world we want uh, very soon? And how do we end poverty everywhere? How do we have greater equality? How do we have sustainable infrastructure? How do we end hunger? How do we have food security, health, education, social inclusion, and gender empowerment? And yet, how will all, the, how will all these goals become fully uh, compatible? You know, when I was a younger diplomat in the early 90s, the debate around sustainable development used to often be cast where the group I belonged to, the poorer countries, always said, look, guys, let's grow dirty and clean up later. But now that argument is being put to us by the other side of the development spectrum. So it's a little confusing as to where are we on all these issues. Is humanity going to drift inevitably into extinction? Is that the path of humanity? So that's what I want our panelists to focus on. Big picture, big actions, and how do we get to the world we want as soon as possible. David, I'm going to start with you because I've always admired your ability to bring big issues into consideration, uh, what sometimes otherwise become little siloed uh, domain knowledge expertise. So David, tell us, what are your two, three big ideas? How are we going to do things at an unprecedented scale, which everyone is asking us to do? Every report, every assessment, every outlook. Nikhil, thank you very much indeed. Do you know, this is my first UN Environment Assembly. I've been to UNEP meetings before, and I have been really impressed by the way in which many of the people I have met here are approaching their work. In a nutshell, you are all dealing with issues of enormous importance for the future of possibly 10 billion people in our world in 2050. And you are managing to do it with a sense of optimism and, I believe, a sense of achievement. So I've been asking myself in the days I've been here, what is it that seems to be special about the people here. Like, what is it that's special 
about all the people who are working on the sustainable development agenda. I think the most important starting point is, as Nickel has just said, we are all systems thinkers. We don't see the world as a series of discrete problems for which there is one easy remedy, a sort of vaccine. No. We see the world and our own tasks in the world as complex, needing to be addressed through multiple actions, sometimes not always in a nice, neat sequence. And this is really very much the case when it comes to thinking about the future of food. Because food comes to us through a mix of systems which interplay with each other in quite extraordinary ways. They are not easy, linear systems with a beginning, a middle, and an end. They involve multiple actors working with different agendas. So those of you who are working on food systems have to be people who can handle many different perspectives in their heads at the same time without dismissing some as being wrong, but instead entertaining a big variety. The view of the farmer, the view of the nutritionist, the view of the ecosystems expert, the view of the biodiversity specialist, the view of the climate change actor, the view of the retailer. Food means different things to different people. And because of that, I've found in this UN Environment Assembly, yesterday in a meeting of the Environment Management Group, a willingness of people to accommodate multiple perspectives at the same time, to see food as a product of systems and to see the big picture as well as the little picture, and to try to find directions to move into that will actually mean that everybody can access nutritious and healthy food that is produced sustainably. Because, they all know, if we can't do that, then we will be irreversibly damaging our world, reducing biodiversity, emptying aquifers, destroying people's health and nutrition, creating more disease. So, how is that effort being done in practice? A minute. First of all, you accept that there will be differences of opinion. You accept that there will be political debate. You accept that even the science is contested. One person's truth is seen as another person's heresy. But you connect people together ruthlessly. You get people to talk to each other 30 seconds, who don't normally talk, because through connection comes a willingness to understand. Through that willingness to understand, even in the most awful political context, comes a willingness to align and last five or 10 seconds. Once you are aligned, the possibility of working together actually happens. I have seen it now, more than 60 countries, food systems moving towards sustainability. And your environment management group here in UN Environment is creating the right platform on which this occur. Not long enough to tell you the whole story. Come and see me afterwards. I'll talk to you in great detail about what I've learned about your abilities as systems thinkers. Thank you, David. In fact, at the end, if we can come back to the panelists, if we have time, I would like you to go a little more into the question of inequalities and how it's linked to uh, the type of thing we're discussing. That's a very, very important issue which sometimes gets skimmed over. Christine, I want to now focus on you. You talked not so long ago about everything relating to 2020 and beyond and the hopes you have for 2020 and beyond. But I want you to focus on another thing, which is a lesson for these maths not working out. What, in your perception, have been the biggest implementation gaps? 
when I look at the other issues uh, in a similar position, I think one of the problems is it doesn't enter national planning systems as it should. Second, it doesn't enter national budgets or the national financing arrangements as effectively. Third, it doesn't have effective multi-stakeholder engagement. Uh, fourth, it sometimes you don't have enough data and scientific evidence to force that political galvanization of action. Do you think some of these apply to your world? And how do you, what are the two, three big ideas you have to make the implementation dimension really work uh, for the future of the world we want? Thank you so much and good afternoon. It's a pleasure to, to be with all of you here. Uh, I happen to be a systems ecologist by training, so I, I think systems. <laughs> no, no, it's a long time ago. Uh, but um, you, were, you were asking um, um, big ideas. So if I wanna, if you allow me to be a bit provocative here, I think you know, all, all the items that you, that you mentioned do of course apply to the convention. But if we really wanna see something happening different, I think we need to go back to the very, very roots of the problem. For me, I think one of the big uh, um, uh, issues in terms of the root of the problem, it's stemming from the philosophical approach that we have in our engagement with nature. Uh, we human species are of course the dominant one, are the most evolved one, and therefore I think we evolved into thinking that uh, you know, we can control and dominate all the other systems. The scientific reality is that we are just you know, uh, at the top of the, of the line there, but we are not controlling anything. Um, and from this philosophy, I think evolved also our economic development and growth models since industrial, uh, industrialization 200 plus years ago, which do not recognize natural capital and nature in the whole growth and development function. We treat, um, you know, we always think that we can come up with some technological fix if, if things don't go well, but we did, do not have it in our mind that we operate in a system that is bounded by the planetary systems on one hand, and then of course by most recently discussions on the social system. So there is a space where we human can exist and thrive and develop, but for that I think we need to go to the fundamentals and really literally change the economic models. Now that's easier said than done because at any economic 101 class you will take in college, you would learn the neoclassical model, which is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about ecological economics. That being said, so what we've been trying to do, I think, it was very much along what you, uh, what you just said, this whole idea of let us grow first and then we clean after, you know, the, the inverse uh, Kuznets curve. But that reality doesn't that the planet doesn't operate like that. It was a bit of a, maybe ignorance on our side or, or arrogance. It just doesn't operate like that. So how can we, how can we change that? Uh, we were trying to have these sort of linear solutions to complex problems, and that's not gonna get us anywhere. We will need to come up with more complex, integrated, holistic approaches. We've been talking about that for 20 plus years now. We've been seeing some progress and change, but that needs to become the mainstream approach, the mainstream philosophy. So if I can do anything, I'll go back to the economic colleges and I will, I will teach them a different way to do economics. That's, that's uh, one. And from that, it, I think a lot of things uh, stem. One now, minute. Um, one minute. Second, changing the way we communicate this agenda. And as you said, it's either biodiversity or oceans or climate. It's still in our minds, we are still fragmenting the issue. We've been talking about biodiversity as an environmental problem to which we need to find environmental solutions. And that's missing the point that all this web of life, the totality of forms of life on earth are really the infrastructure are what's supporting us to exist here. When that deteriorates, we, we see you know, consequences for our food security, for climate change, etc. There are trillions of microbes living in our own organisms that allow us to function as a system. And they are biodiversity as well, by the way. We never thought, you know, we never talk about that, but they are important. When those systems don't work, we get sick. So to change all this, I think we need to change the narrative. We need to focus more on the optimistic and the positive message. We need to explain to people that biodiversity is not just a thing out there. It's not just about some nature abstract concept out there. It's all of us and it's in us. And secondly, we need to make it um, relevant for people 
to understand why is this important for them. And there are two critical entry points. One is through the food systems, because without healthy biodiversity and, and ecosystems, we won't have food. And second, it's health. The connection between biodiversity, healthy biodiversity, healthy um, um, food, and then our own health, it's becoming more and more clear, and it's, it's moving into a, a systemic approach approach to, to addressing the problem. Good. Just to end on, on one note, for those of you who are interested, uh, the CBD Convention sets the International Day for Biodiversity team every year. It's on 22nd of May, and we decided this year to focus it on our biodiversity, our food, our health. So to really open up the space and the conversation beyond environmental issues. In conclusion, I think with this and everything else that we'll do in the run-up to post-2020 in the new global biodiversity framework, we will be wise enough, smart enough, bold enough, determined enough to come up with a, with a framework that would allow a shift, a transformation in all the systems level with much more concrete implementation and really making a difference of, on the ground. A successful Thank COP you. is not just a successful policy that's ag agreed by 196 parties. A successful Thank policy you. is the one who gives results. Thank you. Ground. Thank you, Sorry. Christine. Mami, I am turning to you. Because we all know that environmental stress and disasters are caught in an embrace of death. And uh, everything we're reading on environmental stress is getting more and more acute. So your work of reducing loss and damage will become even more intense. So how do you think you're going to cope with the future which looks so unpredictable mm -hmm. and horrific if you are to add up all the outlooks we've read this week? Thank you, Nikhil. Um, so, uh, Indeed, um, uh, my job and the job of the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction is to uh, not only raise awareness about this loss and damage of the current situation and the future, but to uh, support people to act on it. And I always feel, why are we not acting on it? And I think the, the issue is we don't understand really what we're facing. I think that's still the big issue. A lot of countries don't have data on their historic loss, and a lot of countries don't have data on the probabilistic loss in the future because there's not enough uh, people in, on the ground or financial resources to first capture uh, what is happening in terms of uh, disaster loss and damage. So well, we did a study last year, and in terms of economic losses, it seems that from the major disasters, only about 40% uh, of the loss is what we know. So we, we think we know what we're losing whenever disaster comes, and we say we have to prevent that, but we don't know the whole picture. And this is only about direct loss. It doesn't even include the indirect loss. Okay, so um, uh, that's, a, that's a big thing. And, um, and I do feel that um, unless we, we we make this big jump about really understanding what's happening, um, we won't be able to act. And in terms of uh, food, so the agriculture sector, um, around 25% of all the loss and damage from disaster is absorbed by the agriculture sector. And uh, we know, also know that uh, in the developing world, and we also know that 80% of it comes from drought. But again, drought is a very, very difficult disaster um, hazard that we still don't know the full grasp of, of. Scientists are moving forward, but we still need to study more. So my um, suggestion is that a um, science uh, can really help us move forward. And in terms of science, uh, science, scientists and academics are important in making us, allowing us understand. But I would say that, like this morning's One Planet Summit, there was this argument that we need more scientists in Africa, African scientists. Because the solution, we talk about innovative solutions, but innovative solutions are different from continent to continent, from country to country. So you can't just import something that was innovative in Europe or America and bring it here. You need to do that. That's so, education, I think that's very important. Um, secondly, um, I would say that um, you said what are the uh, big unprecedented scale ways of doing, um, making a difference. I would say that you know, we can start by uh, small things at the community level. So for example, when we talk about drought, um, water reservoir, right? Um, when you compare the figures, and this is a bit undated, uh, 
uh, but uh, it seems that um, around 2013, the per capita water reservoir in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, was about 200 cubic meters. And then in, this was in Thailand, around 1,200. And I think it was uh, close to um, 6,000 in North America. So what can we do to solve something like this? Um, the solution might be quite um, nearby, uh, we, we, and it might not need that much science, but starting with something as, um, as simple, I would say, and practical like this, and bringing the um, different stakeholders uh, to uh, help this happen, this would uh, upscale things. So that's the second thing I would mention, and I'll stop here. Thank you so much, Mami. Father um, Kuri Thadam, such a pleasure to see the Holy See as part of this panel. You know, when you look at the UN and other institutions, I think the biggest problem we have is to reach that last mile, that last mile which connects us to communities and the millions of people, for example, related to the food system, the millions of people who work on farms who are going to be the real harbingers of change. But engaging them is, for us, a big challenge. But faith-based organizations and you, uh, you um, the, the church, have the great power to be able to be agents of that kind of change, of bringing the science to the people, of bringing new cropping patterns to the people, of bringing new say, drought resistant agriculture to the people, and convincing them of how to do things differently. So Fa Father Kuratitam, how do you see your enhanced role? Because everyone is now talking about urgent action on a great transformational scale. But how can we do that without reaching the community? And how is, uh, what is your vision of how uh, faith-based organizations can help in that? Thank you, sir, for these very kind words. Uh, and good afternoon to everyone. It's a great joy and pleasure to be able to represent the Vatican at this panel. And uh, I would like to share with you just three messages responding to the questions you raised. First thing about motivation, the second thing about vision, and the third thing about mission or action. To begin with motivation, you know, we just concluded a very good conference at the Vatican last Saturday on the SDGs and religions. And one of the speakers, before he began, he said, uh, uh, before he left home, he told his seven-year-old seven son that he was coming to the Vatican. And this little boy told him, Dad, when you meet Pope Francis, who, tell him you are the world's president, and tell him to take care of our trees and us children. And that really motivates me to be able to represent here Pope Francis, because I think ultimately the question is the future we are leaving to our children. Mm -hmm. I often quote, uh, an Irish theologian who says, if our generation does not act, no generation can repay the damage that we are causing to our common home, to our children. And that's a huge, huge responsibility. So I think we need to be motivated in a very human, human sense, like think of our children. And all of us are either fathers or mothers, grandfathers or grandmothers, uncles or aunties. And we do have, we do have children we love. I think we need this, this motivation. We, don't, we have hardly 10 years that we have been talking about it. Let's really get motivated. Think of our own children, our grandchildren, and the future generation. The first thing is, that's, that's probably where the faith communities can do, motivate people. Second thing is vision. I think we lack vision. We need to think of earth as our common home, where everything is connected. That's the mantra of Laudato Si, Pope Francis' encyclical on the care for our common home. We know Earth is 4.52 billion years old. Life began 3.8 billion years ago. And they say as the biodiversity reached its peak, almost humanity came on the scene just 200,000 years ago. And uh, then again, when we began to have the climate stability, last 10,000, 11,000 years, the Holocene, agriculture began. So everything is connected, climate stability, food security, biodiversity. So we need to really, as you said at the beginning, an integrated approach. And common home is the right word for that, that all these things are, 
are connected. I think one of the challenges we face is compartmentalization. I know some of the environment ministers are here. You look after the environment, someone else looks after agriculture, someone else transportation, someone else energy, and we don't get anywhere. So we need to really connect things. And the third thing is action. And there again, we, can act, we should act as a common human family. In a family, when we act, we do it together. So we, 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 our borders, our frontiers are not really natural. And this is a critical moment when we need to come together to act together. Let me say two things that we can do according to me. One thing is what we are trying at the, at the Vatican is that we need to create a people's movement from below. And from my little experience coordinating the Office of Ecology and Creation at the Vatican, I find hope in four groups. One, uh, the first group is young people. Just this afternoon, I had a very good meeting with a group of young people who want to do a big meeting here in Africa, bringing the whole of Africa together. And so and young people are moving around the world. They're not waiting for us. And that really also gives us hope that we just need to walk with them. The second group we have, we find very hopeful, is our indigenous communities. They have taken care of our common home for thousands and thousands of years. I think it's a moment when we, we usually consider them as being you know, native, superstitious, you know, close to the earth for that. But I think it's a time for humanity, the churches, the UN, our governments, to sit at their feet and listen to their wisdom their sobriety, their sober way of living, and so much we can learn from them. And the third group that gives us hope are religious communities, faith communities. And we are, you know, nearly 86% of humanity. If all the religions were to come together, if all the churches were to come together, what an impact we can have. And I, I think religious group, we are, we are late, but we are waking up. So that gives us hope. And the fourth group is women. We are in Kenya and Nairobi, Bangari Matai, and um, uh, uh, we have the chief co I come from India. We have the chief co movement in India 20, 25 years ago, and the entire northern Himalayan region is, was saved by indigenous women. Mm. So these groups give us faith. So we need concrete but also concerted people's action. And the last thing, or the, in this action, the second point I wanted to make is I said we need to act as a common family. And in a family, the mothers will hear, will watch what I say. We, we put the, the weakest at the center. When a child falls sick, the entire family comes around that child. And if we are a common human family, we need to put the poor at the center, the vulnerable, the migrants, and you know, all these people. Then I think our movement will go forward, because it's a real unity. And we talk of being inclusive, but sometimes it's a, it's a cliche, don't leave anyone behind. Let's begin with uh, the most vulnerable people, then truly we are inclusive. Allow, if you. You allow me 30 seconds, the last thing. You know, I was moved to, to sit here for one reason, you know. Till two weeks ago, I was scheduled to take the flight, which unfortunately crashed. And I said, you know, all of us have a destiny. You are environment, environment ministers, ambassadors, NGO coordinators, doing so many things. But I think all of us, you know, we, we live on this planet, the garden planet, so beautiful, for a few years, 70, 80, 90, who knows, whatever. I think all of us have a mission. And uh, I think when, we have, when I've lived my life, I should say, I have left something behind. I have contributed to the, to the well-being of this planet, of our common home for common, hu common human family. So I really wish that at this meeting we go out determined to leave a very positive legacy for our children, for our grandchildren, and the future generations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. I think, I think you're evoking the memory of that crash uh, points to the fragility of everything we do, the fragility of life itself, and uh, the consequences we are, we, sometimes I feel that humanity uh, is in a quicksand which we've created for ourselves. And we are just sinking deeper in and deeper into this quicksand. And we really don't know how to extricate ourselves. But your uh, sort of feeling uh, on the
power of a people's movement, the power of youth, the power of indigenous people's actions, the power of religious communities, of interfaith dialogue, of women's participation, and the spirit of solidarity and acting together as a family, that's what's going to get us out of this quicksand. It's a very powerful message, so thank you very much for that. Ambassador Peter Thompson, it's your turn next. Uh, you have been very devoted to the implementation of SDG 12, and we know how much energy you've put into what was often an often, uh, often issue, actually. So, uh, Ambassador Thompson, my question to you is this. When you look at the outlook and the state of our world's oceans, uh, and we look at scale and speed, do you think we are getting where we want to get at the scale and the speed we require? If not, what are the two, three areas you'd like to see much more happen in the next few months? Okay, I'll start now, not 15 <laughs> seconds ago. <laughs> uh, you asked us to speak for three minutes, so I'm, uh, if I end abruptly, you'll know why. And I do believe in time management and these things. So uh, thank you for mentioning SDG 12. It is my favorite SDG 12, uh, changing consumption and production patterns. But as you know, I'm actually the advocate for SDG 14, the ocean's goal. Uh, SDG 14, conserve and sustainably use the resources of the ocean, uh, can in fact feed the world if it's done with uh, the right respect and balance. Uh, when we talk about the blue economy, I'm not actually interested in being any part of the blue economy. I'm interested in being part of the sustainable blue economy, which was the outcome of the Nairobi conference here November last year. Because a sustainable blue economy can, in fact, not only feed the world, but give us everything we need to maintain a human civilization. But it has to be done with respect and balance. Uh, I'm a minute in already, and I want to make three bullet points. Firstly, how can we uh, ensure that that is the case? The first one is illegal fishing. At, we still, in spite of SDG 14.4, are taking $23 billion worth of fish out of the sea illegally. That is stealing from nature. It's stealing from those of us that are doing it legally. All of us in, in our lives have been receivers of stolen goods because of this. There is one way to fix that, the FAO's PSMA agreement. 87 countries have signed it. By this time next year, we want every country in the world to have signed it. If your country hasn't, you're part of the problem. Sign FAO's PSMA. That stops illegal fish being landed in your ports. Uh, and we've sent that message to G20 and G7. If there are representatives of G7 and G20 present, we want to see that statement being made when you have your big meetings this year. Then a message to WTO, harmful fisheries subsidies. Governments give $20 billion worth of uh, subsidies to uh, mainly industrial fishing fleets, which go out to chase the, uh, the, the diminishing fish stocks with this overcapacity that depends on these harmful fisheries subsidies. See the human madness in that and stop the harmful fisheries subsidies immediately. And both those two things that I've mentioned are targets under SDG 14 that mature in 2020. So this is immediate work. It's sprint. It's not marathon, folks. So take that message back to your WTO ministers. They have to ban those harmful subsidies this year. 2019 is the deadline for them. And uh, I've got another 15 seconds or so to go, and I'll say that sustainable aquaculture is the answer to our protein. The Eat Lancet report says we've got to eat less red meat and a lot more fish protein. If you look at the fact that we're driving our wild fish stocks to extinction through those activities I've just mentioned, the answer obviously lies in sustainable aquaculture. That means new kinds of species being raised sustainably with shellfish and algae and seaweeds. This will feed the world if we get the right feed stocks and put the new uh, sustainable aquaculture in the right environmental locations, and that, folks, will be the way that our kids and grandchildren will be eating in the future, I believe. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Thompson. Uh, Gustavo and GF, before giving you the floor, I need to accommodate the Minister of Brazil because uh, he needs to leave. Minister, I'll give you the floor, but I'll urge you, as I'm urging all the panelists, to look at the scale and speed of change that we need. And I've, I've requested all the panelists to get out of their domains and to talk about the larger vision 
of getting to where we need to get very urgently. And I'd request all the ministers, actually, because all of you have thought about these issues, not only in your national context, but also globally. What are the two or three big things that the world needs to do, using the Brazilian example, for ex uh, you, you can use that, to do things differently to get where we need to? Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, dividing to three different issues, I will address the first of all the priority number one, which has been left for the period before uh, we joined the ministry. Uh, would say that the urban areas, the quality of urban areas, sanitation, all of these items related to the to the urban um, uh, level of quality is something that we need to address immediately especially sanitation and waste management are things that cannot wait until the next period of conversations or initiatives from uh, Brazil and uh, governments. We need to address this, this problem right now. And we need to address in a very effective way, considering the, all of the aspects that we need, such as transparency, meritocracy, uh, following the, all, all of the metrics that we have, must be something uh, very effective and urgent. The second is how we deal with the deforestation of Amazon. We need more monitoring and a quality monitoring for, for the Amazon and then uh, initiatives to surveil and act in a very effective way as well. Management in a, in a good perspective of that is crucial for the success of these initiatives. Times for discussion, the seminars in, the, in this areas in Brazil has passed already. We need to act in a very effective way. And on the third part, we need to uh, pay attention of the good uh, instruments that we have on agriculture field. Brazil is an example of sustainable development of the agriculture. We have increased the productivity without increasing this, the, the areas of deforestation. Brazil reduced the emissions on, by 74% within the last 15 years. So there's a, some, a model that we need to follow, and Brazil is increasing the quality of the, its agriculture and uh, all of the areas in the production. So I think probably the most effective uh, message that we can bring is the good ideas and examples that we have in Brazil need to be analyzed and implemented in an effective way with management, with uh, transparency, and something that can be measured. Otherwise, uh, we are spending a lot of money without achieving the results. And something that we need in Brazil right now is achieving the results. Thank you so much, uh, Minister. I think uh, what you say uh, resonates particularly with me because I've been in this business now since 1990 and with 1992, the Earth Summit in Rio. And since then, we've spawned so much legislation. We have conventions, we have MEAs. Uh, I don't know how much legislation in this area we've spawned. But then you look at all these r outlook reports. They're all terrible. So something's gone wrong between the legislative frameworks we've established and the actions we've taken. So I think the need to refocus people's minds away from just normative frameworks to doing something to change the situation. That's the message I get and which resonates very strongly with me, who for the last 30 years has been uh, who just hoping for change coming through legislation, but that change doesn't come through legislation alone. Gustavo? Uh, one thing, Gustavo, Jeff obviously chases and supports projects. Now, the problem is that no matter how much money Jeff has, the number of projects we need for this transformational change will increase only exponentially. So my question is, is there some thinking within Jeff of the nature of projects you need to support so that the accelerator influence of the types of leveraging you do through these projects is much more significant than your current portfolio of projects? Because we are talking scale and we are talking speed. How will Jeff meet this challenge? Thank you, Nico. Um, I, I'll start with uh, your opening words, which were, you know, we are not adding up. And there's no, nothing so close to home to the GF than that message. We've been the financial mechanism of all the five uh, international conventions that deal with the environment uh, for close to 30 years. And although we have uh, spread around the world 
uh, seeds uh, through very, very successful projects on the ground, and each one of them, uh, for the most part, left a tree in place. This tree is not becoming a forest. And, and, and beyond that, uh, this forest has been threatened by uh, multiple drivers that interconnect, and our response to them has been, uh, over the years, very sectorally driven. And, and the conventions are very important, but uh, when it comes to financing, we came to realize that at the national level, you can't do things uh, in isolation. Take, for example, agriculture and the food systems that was mentioned here several times. Uh, we don't have uh, a, a field that's called food systems or agriculture in the Jeff, but any project that's going to deal with biodiversity, land uh, degradation, with emissions, uh, land-based uh, emissions from pesticides and chemicals uh, and fresh water, all within the realm of the Jeff, they are being treated in isolation, and we can't anymore do that. So we decided to really integrate these lines of funding when it comes to working with countries. And now we promoted uh, something that we call the Fo Food Land Use and Restoration Program. It's, a, it's an integrated program uh, for the next uh, four years in which uh, the investments are trying to bring multiple benefits to bear and not just uh, sectoral uh, uh, benefits. Uh, we've provided the largest amount of funding uh, this time around, close to $500 million. And that uh, alone we expect to mobilize another $3 billion uh, in financing uh, that is going to go to developing countries. So we are multiplying the money, and I know that money, uh, particularly at that scale, is not sufficient, but more importantly, we are bringing these, these sectors together. We have a global platform that includes most of the big players in the food system, but also uh, at the national level, small and medium enterprises that are uh, also trying to shift their, their production. So the approach is to look at the horizontal side of this, which is the land use planning, uh, and how we deliver across the, the landscape multiple benefits in the vertical dimension, which will bring supply chains and a big divider chains to speak to one another. So we hope that by integrating all of this, we can provide much more uh, to the conventions, much more to the, the customers and the client countries, and uh, hopefully this is a seed for transformation that uh, will transform these uh, trees progressively in forests that interconnect and produce the global benefits. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if Germany still wants to speak or the minister has left. Uh, would you still like to speak? Or oh, maybe later. Uh, so Denmark, uh, would you like to take the floor now? Certainly. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and thank you for, for giving me the, the opportunity to, to speak. And thank you for, for all your, your valuable inputs. Let me just, um, and, and forgive my, my brief, blunt uh, manner. I'm Scandinavian. That's the way we do it. Um, just to comment on, on two things, uh, biodiversity and, and food waste. Uh, because um, when it comes to, to, to biodiversity, as, as one of the founders uh, of the Amsterdam Declarations uh, Partnership, uh, we also paid uh, particular attention to, to the need for further action to uh, ensure sustainable and, and deforestation-free agricultural uh, commodity chains. With agricultural expansion uh, being uh, the main driver for deforestation globally, uh, this is a focal area of uh, the utmost importance for biodiversity. And I absolutely agree with, with my colleague from Brazil. This is something that we need to pay uh, a lot of attention to. And despite all the efforts done uh, during the last week or two weeks, um, we've come to the disappointing conclusion that this is not possible to reach a consensus on. Um, on a, a UNEA resolution that stresses the need to improve uh, the sustainable uh, agricultural commodity supply chains uh, with respect to forests. And the reason I find this uh, somewhat disturbing or concerning is that uh, it seemed impossible also to just reaffirm our collective uh, commitments on halting deforestations, uh, and that's part of the SDGs. It shouldn't be hard to, to uh, agree upon. Um, let me just say a few words about food waste, uh, because uh, the responsibility to, to meet uh, the SDGs on food waste, uh, they must be shared by all actors throughout the food chain from, from farm to fork. Um, this calls for an ongoing dialogue between all parties to identify uh, legal barriers and to share uh, best practices and to exchange ideas. Um, Danish companies are specialized in providing technical solutions, equipment, know-how to expand their production to eliminate the food waste from the entire uh, chain through cold storage and cold chain and logistics and so on. 
Supermarkets sell food that are close to the expiry date for a cheaper price. We have smartphone apps to help facilitate relations between uh, customers and businesses like bakeries and restaurants that sell their products right before uh, closing time. But despite several years of uh, initiatives to reduce the food waste in Denmark, we're still wasting uh, 700,000 tons of food every year. And that has to change. Uh, and if we are to shift into a higher gear, we need these, all these parties to, to collaborate. Uh, so I've launched uh, a think tank uh, with a focus on reduction on, on food waste um, and, and the prevention of food waste uh, to, to have the ambition to make Denmark sort of a pilot country on bringing all these parties together. So hopefully uh, we, can, uh, we can come back uh, with some uh, thoughts and ideas uh, that will make us go uh, even further on, on this agenda. Thank you for Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Distinguished Minister from Spain. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Seth. I'm quite happy to see you here. Uh, and I hope we could talk later, after the last time we saw each other in Madrid. I'll turn now to Spanish. As you know, it's a very beautiful language, and fortunately we have uh, translation. Um, si queremos alcanzar resultados exitosos, necesitamos encontrar enfoques y soluciones innovadoras. Esto resulta especialmente significativo en el binomio alimentación-biodiversidad. Eh, los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible no podrán alcanzarse si no se abordan desde enfoques sectoriales <coughs> no integrados. Yeah, sorry. Okay, sorry. All right. So I'll start again. Si necesitamos alcanzar resultados, si queremos alcanzar resultados exitosos, necesitaremos encontrar enfoques y soluciones innovadoras. Y esto es especialmente cierto, señor presidente, en el binomio alimentación-biodiversidad. Los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible no podrán alcanzarse si se abordan desde enfoques sectoriales que no estén integrados. Así, por ejemplo, no será posible alcanzar o avanzar hacia los objetivos de erradicación de pobreza y seguridad alimentaria si no es mediante enfoques que tengan plenamente en cuenta la integración de los objetivos medioambientales y de conservación de la biodiversidad y los ecosistemas. Con demasiada frecuencia, el fomento de sistemas agrícolas intensivos insostenibles, con el objetivo de responder a las necesidades de producción de alimentos, ha supuesto una sobreexplotación de recursos naturales y una degradación de los ecosistemas. Esto es una solución a corto plazo que no resuelve los problemas de fondo. Las estimaciones actuales sugieren que en los próximos años la demanda mundial de alimentos podría seguir aumentando hasta alcanzar en el año 2050 un 50% más de la actual. Simultáneamente, el impacto ambiental de la producción de alimentos tendría que reducirse al menos dos tercios. Es evidente que estos objetivos, aparentemente enfrentados entre sí, solo podrán alcanzarse si se adoptan enfoques innovadores y diferentes de los tradicionalmente aplicados. Es preciso, por tanto, orientarse hacia una producción eficiente y rentable, pero más sostenible y respetuosa con el medio ambiente y menos intensiva en el uso de insumos, que permita producir más alimentos empleando menos recursos y contribuyendo positivamente a la preservación y mejora del medio ambiente y de la biodiversidad. Para ello deben incentivarse prácticas agrarias y ganaderas que respeten y contribuyan a la conservación de la biodiversidad adaptadas a las condiciones y necesidades de cada entorno. Pero mejorar la sostenibilidad de la, de la producción de alimentos no es suficiente. Es además preciso promover patrones de consumo sostenible, por ejemplo, mediante una mayor sensibilización e información de los consumidores y la mejora de la transparencia de los mercados. Por todo ello, mi delegación declara nuestro compromiso y voluntad de profundizar en la innovación de nuestros modos de producción, pero también de innovar en el ámbito de los cambios sociales imprescindibles para lograr patrones de producción y consumo más sostenibles. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much. South Africa, would you like to participate now in this debate? Singapore. Singapore. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Ambassador. Please. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I, 
I'm Masagos Environment for, uh, Minister for Environment and Water Resources, and come 1st April, uh, food is also coming into my portfolio. But what that has, has enabled us to do is to look at food security from a different point of view than what we are doing today. Because today we import 90% of our food, and 90% food security means diversifying as much as possible as the sources of the food as possible. Mm -hmm. But that's not going to be possible in the, in the midterm and more so in the long term. Because of three factors that we see will, will impact this uh, security from diversification. One, growing populations from f source countries where more food will be sequestered for local rather than for, for export. Mm -hmm. Two, uh, environmental damage that's happening to all these places because of the egregious act that they're doing now and I think will come to roost in future. And thirdly, because the climate change impacts are already being seen in many of these places, particularly because we have seen floods, we have seen droughts happening in quick succession and intensity. And therefore, what Singapore is going to do now that we have take, I've taken over this, this issue, this, this, uh, this problem, um, in the portfolio of environment and, and water resources, is to look at it from strategically how do we grow locally. And therefore, our goal now is to grow 30% of our nutritional needs by 2030, which is about 10 years from now. And mind you, this is going to be a huge uh, jump because we are only having 10% of what we are growing locally. And doing so will only be possible if we resort to what technology can afford us today and tomorrow. So Singapore is going to resort to all, a lot of R&D. In fact, 250 million US dollars has been, has been allocated for water, environment, and food to ensure that when we pursue this, we pursue this understanding that we have to preserve the integrity of the environment. We have to also respect the need to produce sustainably and also to attain what we call big, hairy, audacious goals, which is to produce it at net zero waste, at net zero energy, and even net zero water. And I think this can be done because some countries are pursuing singular goals, like Netherlands, for example. I know they are trying to work hard to produce food at net zero energy. UAE, for example, has a lot of energy but no water, so they are trying to produce uh, food at net zero water. Singapore is going to bring all this in, hopefully through technology and R&D and working together, and to be able to produce our 30% need of our nutritional need by 2030. We call it 30 by 30 strategy, using technology to produce zero food at zero watts, zero waste, and zero water. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister. Now, uh, the distinguished minister from Iceland. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I will be short and mention only one point, which is dirt or soils. Soils which are an important component of the food security slash sustainable and climate smart agriculture slash poverty nexus. Um, well, in essence, as you know, soils are this thin layer on the Earth's surface. However, it's commonly one of those sort of forgotten ecosystems uh, how, however important they are to sustainable development. And soil is uh, one, of of one of nature's most complex ecosystems, contains a myriad of organisms which interact and contribute to the global cycles that make all life really possible on Earth. And therefore, in my opinion, the soil conservation is um, a key, or an important key, one of many important keys, to meet the challenges of food security, water and, and climate change. And also for biodiversity, soils are of this uttermost importance. So that was my short and maybe sweet point. Thank you, sir. Um, I unfortunately need to leave and I thank you for the floor. Thank you, Minister. Now I'm wondering if there are other ministers. Costa Rica, would you like the floor? Yes, thank you, sir. Uh, I can ask as, as a Minister of Government of Costa Rica, I cannot express my highest level of frustration. So, to say something in respect to what I've seen in the last few days. We're talking here at the Minister level about the need to go towards sustainability. In this very specific panel, we're talking about nature conservation, food and health. And yes, we all have a good plan and a good idea on how we should do things. But when we negotiate resolutions, 
The content of the resolution does not reflect what ministers say here, and that is not fair at all. That is not fair. When you see the resolution on forest, deforestation, and food production, what is the level of ambition there? Nothing. No ambitious. But the same delegates, <laughs> the same delegates, the same ambassadors, the same ministers that generate zero ambitions on all of those resolutions, on most of those resolutions, come here in these dialogues and they have a different speech. They have a different language. They talk, they talk about different things. Seems to me that there is no sense of urgency and political commitment to what we have in front of us. I was prepared here to talk about how we can generate a coherent set of policies in the management of our landscapes, on how we should work in an integrated manner within ministries of environment and ministers of agriculture. I prepared a lot of ideas, but all of that is not going to happen because I cannot avoid to express my high level of frustration. Because when I read all of those resolutions, I see that there is no political willingness to really step in and give us what we need. Because we hear many ministers, many ambassadors, and many delegates saying and bragging about what they do in their countries or what we should be doing. But when we need to do really commit on an event as important as this one, we don't see that reflected in the resolution. That is not fair. That is not the way we should do things. I would like to excuse myself for being emotional and frank, but I feel that uh, we need to really realize that time is ticking out. Absolutely. Ticking out. And yes, we all go back to our countries, and we are the privileged citizens of our countries. But our responsibilities are with those who are not here representing a country. Our, our, our uh, obligation and responsibility is with those others who are not here, which we need to represent, and many of them hasn't even born. So please, please, let us step in. Please commit to things that are politically viable. We can commit to many things. We have the science, we got the resources. So why? Why don't we reflect what we say here in these panels in the resolutions? Why don't we do that? It's as simple as that. So are we, are we committed or are we not committed? So I want to excuse myself for my intervention, but I think it's, it's natural to me and it's natural to my country, Costa Rica, which takes very seriously our intra-generational responsibility. Thank you. Minister, the sentiments you've expressed and the applause you've heard is a clear reflection that your sentiment is shared widely, at least in this room. There is a dissonance, as you say, between the intensity of the actions, the speed of actions required, and what we see in the legislative process, which doesn't reflect that same sense of urgency. Here we have humanity sort of walking blindfolded to commit collective suicide at the edge of a precipice. And there we have uh, negotiations which seem as if the process is more important than the product. So that sentiment is shared in this room, uh, Minister, and that's the implementation gap, but it's only with the energy and the emotion and the determination of ministers like you, which gets spread more widely throughout the world, that we are going to get the scale of transformation. Thank you so much. Uh, the Minister Poland, you wanted to come in. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and so distinguished uh, friends. Uh, thank you for this voice for Costa Rica. I also, is, is the truth, is the, the, the voice and spirit of Costa Rica, because I talk many times with uh, Minister Castro, who is now in FEO, and that's yes, true. This, thank you for that, because the, especially in the forestry is the uh, key issue for us, also in the aspect of the COP24 and the forestry declaration. And I think this is something we can use for fight the hunger, for fight the poverty, for fight for food security and build a strong biodiversity. 
it is my pleasure to, to, to be in this event and I have two examples what, uh, what we do in Poland because we have very good natural condition for agriculture, uh, uh, therefore processing sector. Uh, it is very important for our economy. We, this is why we, because we have very good quality of soil. This voice about soil is very important uh, and quality of soil because we don't destroy the soil because the culture of Polish farmers, small farmers, small uh, family was they don't destroy, they don't use the pesticide, they don't use the GMO product to destroy the biodiversity. Uh, and what we, what we do, what is interesting also, we have, uh, I think, the the very interesting example of, of collaboration, the farmers for Baltic Sea, because we have the, 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 the very uh, long coastline uh, of Baltic Sea, and they uh, cooperate together in, in this program uh, uh, in the sustainable agriculture. And the farmers combine typical agriculture, agricultural parts with the small retention objects, uh, with uh, wetlands, vegetables, uh, gardens, and forest. Forest is the key. Um, and this, this is the, the idea is, is promoting, uh, and they, this idea helps because this is the real acting, the uh, order in the limit, the negative impact of the sea waters, and also the build the, the the community. I think this is very important. The, 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 we need this, this strong voice about common home, and this is strong voice about Laudato Sea also as, the, as our responsibility, of brother to brother and sister to sister. Today, in the many panels, we talk about our uh, family atmosphere, but also it's important to introduce also in our activities, uh, and uh, this is something what we are responsible for the. Uh, our children, our family, and our friends, and our future generation. Uh, and this is something we build the community, and this is very, very important, community and responsibility. I think the one, what we do uh, with our uh, neighbors is the Carpathian Convention, a very good example of cooperation when we also promote the uh, sustainable agriculture in the rural development. This is very important. Uh, to, to be active there because uh, we have very good uh, fruitful um, uh, from, from this. We, uh, the, the Carpathian Convention uh, give uh, uh, helping to, to mainstreaming biodiversity uh, uh, and increase biodiversity in this very important region for us. Uh, this, this is very key regional cooperation because we have the synergy between our activities. Is this is something what we want to, to also to share for the sustainable agriculture, sustainable use, land, uh, effective management, uh, and our resources. Resources, what we must keep it, and also must be active, active for the future generation can use this beautiful uh, land when we live. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. I think. I have run uh, through the list of people who requested for the floor, unless there's someone else who wants to. Yes, Martha Rojas. Thank you. Yes, I, I, I was told that I was in the list, so I'm speaking on behalf of the Ramsar Convention on yes. Wetlands. Yes, uh, so uh, I have heard many uh, interventions about the need to make connections, and we have heard a lot about the connections between nature, food security, and poverty. And I wanted to focus on one specific aspect of that, and it's the role of wetlands, which are water-related ecosystems in terms of food security and poverty eradication. And first and foremost, and I was glad to hear the Minister of Singapore refer to water, because we depend on wetlands for water. Most of the water that we use for consumption, for energy, for agriculture, comes from water-related ecosystems. So the future of food depends on the future of water, and the future of water depends on the future of wetlands. Having said that, water is very scarce, and we often talk about 70% of the planet is covered in water, but most of it is salt water or frozen water. So we depend on 0.75% of fresh water in the world. And of this, 0.3% is surface water. And we use 70% of that water in agriculture. So it is very important, and this is perhaps the most important or the main message that I wanted to transmit here, is the importance of linking water with wetland conservation and food security and poverty eradication. Without water, we will not be able to feed the world, and we will not be able to achieve sustainable development. On the other hand, wetlands also provide food, 
and 2.5 billion rural people depend on wetlands for their agriculture. Let's think rice. One billion people depend on rice, and rice grows on wetlands. Let's talk about fisheries. 60, 660 million people depend on fisheries. So I hope that you have heard how important wetlands are. But wetlands are also the most threatened ecosystem in the world. We have lost 40% of the wetlands in the last 40 years. We are losing wetlands three times faster than forests. But Iceland was mentioning about the forgotten ecosystems. I don't think that we are thinking sufficiently about the importance of wetlands for sustainable development. So to finish, my main uh, recommendations that you were saying in terms of action is first, let's look more deeply to the connection between water and ecosystems, and in this case it's wetlands, and Singapore made a point, and food security and poverty eradication. The second one is, in preparing for this meeting, I usually like to, to look at examples. We have many examples. We know what needs to be done. So it's can we build on practices that we know and scale them up so that we can get to the levels of scale that you were referring to. And my third message is let's use the instruments that we already have. So the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands focuses on wetlands, freshwater, and marine and coastal. We have 170 contracting parties. Many of them are here. So that's one of the instruments that is part of this equation. So with that, I will finish my intervention. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you, Marta. <clears throat> I have three more requests, and then I'll quickly turn the floor back to the panel. But I want to forewarn the panel that I do expect to all of you to look at the issue of inequality. Land and land distribution is the basis of great inequalities, particularly in the developing world, and that's actually the root cause of great inequalities. How are you looking at these issues of land redistribution and ownership? And how important is this for the big change that we are seeking? And second, on the issue of gender equality and empowerment, I do expect you to come up with something more powerful. Now, what do we need to do to involve women much more in this transformative change we are seeking? So that's just early warning to you. And then I go to Indonesia. Madam, uh, you have the floor. Indonesia. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. It is my great honor to have this opportunity to address this important dialogue and shares Indonesia's uh, new paradigm in managing natural resources, especially forests. Uh, this includes the ways we promote social forestry, biodiversity conservation, address food security, and contribute to the inclusive economic growth. Uh, optimizing uh, forest productivity and shifting to forest management is critical to eradicate the uh, poverty, creating uh, economic opportunities, uh, and hand -hand, uh, enhancing inclusive uh, economy. Indonesia have uh, identified the main challenges of our environment and forestry. We then set up main approach to address the challenges. Based on the main approach, we develop policy instruments to ensure the workability of the approaches comprising socio-forestry, sustainable management of the uh, essential ecosystem, such as pitland management, mangrove, and making SDG as reference. We also establish indicators to assess the successfulness of our effort comprising three aspects, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, more equitable land holding and business configuration, and last, the development of the appropriate system and technology. So as the result of our commitment in accelerating social forestry program, for example, the proportion of forest area that can be accessed by community. Before 2015, the community can only manage 7% of the forest area. But after 2015, uh, mid-2018, uh, it increased significantly to become 33%. This reflects our effort in accelerating the provisions of greater community access to forest resources. Uh, the new paradigm is not only considering environmental and social aspect of the forest management, but also the economic aspect. Thus, we also, uh, also encourage forest-based industry including at the community level, to enhance uh, economic contribution of environment and forestry sector to the national development. 
In strengthening the implementation of the paradigm, several key actions are needed to be done, including promoting sustainable forest resource management, promoting and promoting people-oriented sustainable forest management with participation of business and private corporate. I'm sure with strong commitment and continuous actions on shifting to sustainable management of ecosystem, we could address our challenges toward the, sustain, uh, the future we want. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank Chair. you so much, Indonesia. Cuba? Thank you. I'm sorry because I will speak in, English, in Spanish. In Spanish. Primero que todo, eh, apoyar al, al planteamiento que ha hecho el compatriota nuestro de Costa Rica, porque realmente hemos percibido que en esta asamblea ha habido un gran ausente en las resoluciones, que es el tema de lo que más urge, que es el cambio climático. Y por tanto suscribimos totalmente. De hecho, tenía preparado toda una intervención en este documento que voy a apartar para centrarnos en los temas de mayor debate. Como dijo un otro compatriota nuestro, ¿no? los representantes de los países van, venimos de cumbres en cumbres y los pueblos van de abismos en abismos. Y es una de las cuestiones que hay que tratar de equilibrar. La inequidad, la pobreza, la falta de género no es causado por el cambio climático. Son temas que se incrementan por el cambio climático pero es una de las cuestiones que ha existido desde que, antes habl que habláramos de cambio climático. Es una de las cosas que no se debe olvidar. Cuba, una pequeña isla del Caribe, aunque es la mayor del Caribe, es un pequeño estado insular, larga y estrecha, como todos saben, vulnerable y, y muy eh, golpeada por los eh, eventos eh, meteorológicos extremos, también víctima de la penetración salina, que afecta a su vez la calidad del agua y con ello el, la agricultura por la salinidad que provocan los suelos, que también padece de sequía, lo que impone una alta explotación de los acuíferos, incrementando esta salinidad, que por suerte tenemos un plan de Estado que denominamos Tarea Vida, aprobado al, al primer nivel del de país con el objetivo de que hasta el 2030 poder adaptarnos y aliviar en lo posible esa elevación del mar con las poblaciones costeras y la incidencia que tiene la cuña salina a la hora de poder usar el agua que en, en bien de la agricultura y la población. No obstante, no quería dejar de decir aquí el tema de la diferencia que hay entre los discursos y las palabras y los hechos y los compromisos. Y usted preguntaba cuáles serían las tres cosas que habría que hacer de inmediato. Nosotros tenemos bien identificado. La primera, educar. La segunda, educar. Y la tercera, educar. ¿Educar en qué sentido? Educar en comprometer a todos del riesgo real que estamos padeciendo. Educar en el compromiso que tenemos con el otro. Esgrimir aquella divisa bíblica de querer al prójimo como uno mismo. La solidaridad de poder compartir lo que se tiene de dinero y de tecnología con los que más lo necesitan menos egoísmo en poder, poder defender y podernos preparar todos en la defensa de esta única casa que todos dicen y la frase es tan, tan bella, pero que realmente con el actuar de nosotros a veces no somos consecuentes con, este, con esta premisa. Y sin el compromiso de todos, juntos, como mismo tenemos juntos el destino, realmente podremos hacer poco. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Minister, I myself am from the world of learning and training and education, and that really resonates with me because I feel the really force multiplier for change has to come from attitudinal and behavioral shifts. And when do we change attitudes and behaviors? We are animals of habit. We change our attitudes and behaviors only through systematic education and learning of the consequences of our not changing our behaviors. But are we doing enough? That's why I keep talking about the last mile. We have to get to that last mile, to the people who are going to change these systems, especially food systems, where uh, we are making a big mistake in allowing this to continue. And the embrace that 
uh, this has caught us in with climate change and water and energy and pollution and everything else is interlocked. But I'm not sure that awareness, training, capacity building, education, that spirit of solidarity you need for this great transformation is taking place. Our last speaker is Germany. Thank, thank you, and Secretary Flassbach unfortunately had to leave for other urgent meeting. But first of all, I would like to, sh to, uh, to express that our delegation fully shares the sentiments of the minister from Costa Rica. So in particular, when it comes to the forest declaration, we are also disappointed about the outcome here. And we would have uh, liked, uh, liked to see more, more ambitious here. My second point also very quickly is on food. Food, food and our dietary has impact on soil and, so, uh, and biodiversity resources, also of course on, on poverty or education. And just to give a few small examples, what, what's, what's happening, what, what, what could be considered. One is vegetarian diet. To, uh, to promote more vegetarian diet is, is uh, reducing the footprint. For instance, the Ministry for, Germ uh, for uh, Environment in Germany is offering only di uh, vegetarian diets if we are hosting, in a, uh, hosting an event, if we are offering um, uh, food for our guests, uh, even including in, in festive dinners. Um, second, I think organic food also offers an opportunity uh, to reduce pesticides, herbicides, nitrogen, promotion of that um, is, is very helpful. The public in Germany is picking that up. And finally, we also have a discussion on, on food loss. Uh, we have a public campaign uh, started, Too Good for the Bin. Uh, it's, it's shared by the full government, and uh, the, the, the public is, is increasingly interested in it, including supermarkets and also, um, also the, uh, the um, food producing companies. Finally, I would like to, to simply uh, highlight one other point which I haven't heard in this debate here, which is on, on what, what governments can do in, in leading, in particular when it comes to public procurement. So we have set up public procurement rules in Germany. We are approving them constantly. But I also would like the opportunity to, uh, to encourage the ED from UNEP and uh, to also uh, apply strict, ambitious, sustainable pro procurement rules here in, in UNEP and also spearhead that within the whole system of, of the United Nations, uh, because that would, would really uh, set an uh, excellent example. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I must say, Germany uh, practices what it preaches, because I had gone to your Ministry of Environment and got only vegetarian food there. And that's the practice now, I believe, in the Ministry of Environment. And we will uh, address your question of procurement and public procurement to, to our panelists. So we come back now to our panelists. And my question to them now is, we've heard a lot. We've heard from each other. We've heard from all of you. And I revert back to my first question. What is going to power the dramatic change we need at the speed we need it? What is it that you have heard encourage you to now say with greater confidence what you might have said earlier? This is how things will change. And this is how we need to think differently. And especially if you can also look at the issues of inequalities. We are promised to reduce inequalities. If you look at ending poverty in all its forms everywhere, which we've also promised to do. And if you look at the issue of public procurement, uh, that will be wonderful. And gender equality and how important that is going to be to powering this change. So let me uh, start uh, maybe from right to left. And uh, Father, you have the floor. OK, so I thought I would be the last one. <laughs> OK, uh, it's been a very, very good panel. And thank you for all those who intervened. Uh, maybe I can sum up my, my response to what you asked in three points. Um, I th there's a, excuse me for quoting the, the, the gospel in the Bible. There's a phrase that says, blessed are those who thirst for justice, for they shall inherit the earth. I think what is missing in our discussions is the thirst for justice, the question of inequality. And we know, we are, we know, we know statistics, the structural injustice between countries, but also among the, the same countries. You know, I come from India. We know how the rich live. A study came out in Princeton University a few years ago that if the richest one billion were to change their lifestyles, we might, we might save the planet. There's another study of Partha Dasgupta and Virabhadra Ramanathan. Uh, das Gupta was the economist in Cambridge, Ramanathan was a uh, climate scientist in Berkeley, and they said climate change 
50% of CO2 emissions come from the 1 billion rich. Nearly 45% from the other 3 billion middle class probably belong to that. And the poor, the bottom 3 billion, contribute as little as 5 to 7%. So I think unless we fire up with the passion for justice, maybe have very few hours left in our discussions, the final resolutions, nothing will come up. We need, we need water, we are thirsty for water, but the greatest thirst we need today is the thirst for justice. To our... Mami. Thank you, Nikhil. I'll come back to your um, question about inequality and gender. But um, I sense that there's a lot of um, urgency, sense of urgency in this room. Um, I agree with you that legislation, convention a lot, but not enough is happening in resolutions, as Ambassador Costa Rica said. But I think that is a first step, because if you don't have the political will to at least, let's say, come up with those frameworks, legislations, conventions, resolutions, you don't have a foundation. And in order to do that, you need a lot of political will. So what you need after that is strong governance, governance to implement these things and finance, money. And the finance, um, as we all know, it is not enough that it comes from governments, um, both in developed countries and in terms of um, uh, flows to developing countries. We need a way to, um, and this has been said to death, but um, uh, engage the private sector more, work in partnership, because at the end of the day, whatever happens to the planet, they are part of the planet. Um, and in terms of inequality um, in land use, um, I think the biggest uh, risk driver now is, um, as the uh, delegate from Brazil was mentioning, is urbanization. And urbanization, rapid and informal, it creates um, really uh, uh, vast inequality. So we need to um, uh, deal with this issue. I don't think we can stop it, uh, but um, at least we can um, slower the pace. One of the things is um, understand why people go to the, the urban area, why do they not want to or cannot stay in the rural area? And once they come to the urban area, how can we upgrade the slums at least? These are the things that we need to do. Women, um, we need to understand that a lot of inequality in terms of gender comes from um, their socioeconomic status. And in order to change that, we need to give them, uh, as you said, education. And education will bring opportunity. I think uh, there's um, uh, no magic one thing, but um, again, uh, providing more education to women, uh, girls, um, allowing, uh, making a, um, a circumstances so that they can go to school and learn, and not only, but use that in order to further their career is the fundamental thing I think that we need to do to uh, change this. And women political leadership, because these women political leadership will understand what women are going through, and they will be able to change things in their country and in their regions. Thank you, Mami. David, you have this wonderful ability of wrapping things up. Uh -huh. And as I give you the flow with those tasks I've already mentioned, I also add that additional task of wrapping up our discussions, which will obviate the need for me to think through that. And uh, so I, I, I give you the for flow you. for three minutes uh -huh. so Great. that you can uh, answer the questions uh, that we had earlier asked and also wrap up our discussions. Thank you very much indeed. I think there are still nearly 200 people in the room. I'm trying to work it out. There's a big cluster over there. There's a lot of people by the door. And this is half an hour beyond the allotted time for this discussion. We started half an hour late. But I'm just saying, I want to make a point. And that is that this is a discussion about leadership. And I've studied leadership over the years. And this has been a very interesting discussion with a lot of useful pointers in it. So I'm going to take the liberty, Nikhil, if you'll let me, of reflecting on some of the patterns of leadership that I'm feeling here in this room and that I think I would like you to hold on to as you leave. So if I can persuade you to stop texting or sending emails just for one minute, because I want to list these out. You see, this assembly is full of warriors for the future. 
You are working for the future. You're not working for now. You're not trying to accumulate your riches now. Your focus is the future. It's a very selfless form of leadership. It requires enormous courage because you're often quite lonely. You're often feeling a sense of powerlessness, a sense of discomfort, because so often you might be able to move, but somebody else next door messes it up and you don't move forward. So what are the things that I've picked up? First of all, and they, they're basically, there are going to be six lines now. The first one is you do engage and you do connect, not just with the people you like to connect to, your friends, your Facebook groups. You make space to connect with those who have less power. And you make the time to be curious about what's happening to them. Secondly, and this is where it gets important, you feel them. But you don't just feel them superficially, like on the television in a soap opera. You actually feel them as they are. It's radical feeling. You feel their passion, but you also feel their deprivation, their injustice. And you feel mostly for those who are not yet here. The children that are going to be born, whose future is being stolen from them by the actions of us here now. Now that is something very special. Thirdly, you are actually applying science all the time. You're picking up knowledge, but you're testing it and you're applying it. Because for you, all of you, knowledge about where the trajectory is going to take us is absolutely key. You're used to hearing projections and you're often testing out those projections. Is it really true? that we're going to overshoot, not just 1.5, but possibly 2 degrees. Is it really true that if we overshoot 2 degrees, there are going to be communities that are just wiped out? And am I going to have a responsibility for that? So I must test it, test it, test it. And that's how science should be. I think, by the way, there should be a word called to science. It should be a verb, which is the process of testing, because it's so important to put to all your knowledge to the test. Fourthly, you courageous leaders, you really want to get people to align for the better. Your different ministries, minister, your different ministries coming together to actually align for the future. And that means you have to be ready for dialogue listening to how others see issues and helping them to get the comfort and the confidence to shift. Fifth, you encourage working in synergy because the alternative is just unthinkable. Synergy between communities, synergy between ethnicities, synergy between religions, synergy between nations. Without synergy, the problems of the size that you are trying to handle cannot be solved. Terrible sense of impotence if you can't get people to work in synergy. And then you have to be able to let go. You have to be able to protect yourself. You have to be able to cope with those terrible evenings of frustration when something you worked for for three months has just been blown away because somebody else chose to ignore it and give a contract to a person to cut down the forest. And that's tricky as well. So this is all about courage. It's all about openness to connect and to keep trying. It's about managing your ego so that that comes below what you're trying to do. It's about your identity as warriors for the future. Thanks. Thank you, David. 
So it's about all of you. We are at the end of this uh, wonderful panel, and thank you, David, and Mami, Father, Christine, Peter, and Gustavo in absentia, all the distinguished ministers who came and participated, all of you who uh, stayed to listen to what we had to say. Of course, there is nothing like the power of ideas, the power of passion, and the power of empathy to add to your list of things, David, which makes people move mountains. And that is what I think we need to see much more, our collective empathy, our collective action, and our collective passion. All of you are in this room, are inspired. We all know why you're here. You all feel strongly about these issues. But our ability to transmit that sense of urgency and passion to those who will really make the change is the real barrier between our intention and our action. And I hope what you've heard will help inspire you to do much more in getting to the people who need this help the most. So have a lovely evening and come back rejuvenated tomorrow. Thanks to all of you. Soft voice, but deep inside. <laughs>